Welcome everybody to the Harassis Mental Health event. Uh, so wherever you are in the world, it's either good morning, uh, good afternoon or good evening. Uh, my name is Gregor Henderson. I am the Director of Mental Health at Public Health England, which is England's agency to protect and improve health and reduce inequalities in health. With the help of five excellent world-class speakers, we will look at the issue of mental health through the lens of the COVID pandemic and ask the key question, how do we all successfully combat the challenge of a potential or in some places a, a mental health crisis? We're going to hear about <laughs> and discuss the approaches that are needed at a strategic level, how to reorganize and transform services, the role of digital strategically, how to empower individuals through their personal data, and how to work towards psychological safety and emotional resilience and take into account diversity and inclusion, especially in the workplace. We have five panelists. I'm going to introduce each of them individually, and they will make their opening remarks for three minutes. And after all five panelists have spoken, we'll open up the chat to uh, everybody and we will take questions and have a discussion for hopefully around about 20 minutes. And then we'll close sharp at 8 uh, a.m. Central European time this morning. And some of the panelists may share some resources with you in the chat function. So if that's the case, then you can see some of the uh, information that people want to share with you. But without any further ado, because we have a very busy uh, agenda this morning to get through and share with you, uh, let me introduce our first speaker, who is Lena Sovold, who's a clinical psychologist based in Norway. She advocates a person-centered and integrative approach to health and well-being. Lena is passionate about promoting mental health, interpersonal skills and empowerment, both within traditional healthcare and e-health contexts, as well as within organizational and educational settings. Amongst recent projects, she's been working on developing an integrative framework to help guide both clinical work and future research in better understanding, evaluating and promoting the user experience across health interventions and contexts. Lena, welcome, and can we hear your three-minute opening remarks? Thank you so much, Gregor. So worldwide, close to one billion people are thought to have a health, a mental health disorder, and a huge percentage of those who need mental health care do not have access to good quality services. So considering the added challenges of COVID-19 and other global disruption, we have reason to be concerned and to talk about a second pandemic or a mental health crisis. This places immense pressure on already overburdened and under-resourced mental health services. Especially given that less than 2% of health budgets are spent on mental health globally. So therefore, no more than ever, we need to prioritize, invest in and promote mental health not only within the healthcare system, but also within the business sector, the educational system, and local communities across the world. And we need to do this in a less fragmented and a more person-centered and holistic way, where treatment, disease prevention, and health promotion is integrated into the same picture and where different stakeholders collaborate and put the interests and needs of people at the center of their strategies and solutions. So to create change for the better, we need not only to see and acknowledge the value of putting mental health more on the agenda, we also need to select and reward compassionate leaders who can take action and lead by example 
and take their part of the responsibility in uh, reducing stigma and in fostering a society of empathy, openness, inclusion and support. So we are at the crossroads and we have a choice to make about which path we would like to take. So let us choose a path towards a more mentally sound and sustainable world for us all. Thank you. Great, thanks Lena, and perfectly on time. Um, let me now introduce Dr. Anton Grech, uh, who is a clinical academic psychiatrist based in Malta. He's the clinical chairman of the Mental Health Services within the Ministry of Health in Malta and the chairman of a national foundation for education on and treatment of eating disorder and a senior lecturer at University of Malta. He has published research in peer-reviewed international journals and his main research interest is the etiology of schizophrenia. Welcome, Anton, and can we have your three-minute opening remarks? Um, welcome, welcome, everybody. Um, what I'm going to talk about is our experience in Malta in terms of the COVID crisis. Unfortunately, um, we had a lot of relapses, patients who were well for long years, and uh, they relapsed. We had a lot of new um, individuals presenting to the mental health services with new illnesses, mainly related to anxiety. And I think this was mainly due to two factors. One, because of the lockdown, there was loss of the social network and people were extremely um, isolated. And also because of the, especially during the initial couple of months of the pandemic, when people did not know really what what is happening, um, many services, um, closed shop, decreased access um, to try to protect um, staff. And unfortunately, this combination led to more psychological suffering within the community. As national services, we had to adapt. And mainly, we made two things. One is that we developed online services, which did not exist before. Um, in that case, both clients and, and professionals were feeling safe and many assessments and treatment modalities with we, we did them on, on on using online but also we have increased um, quite significantly our clinics in the community um, so that um, there is better access um, to services we also developed a telephone helpline where we had both volunteers and and professionals. So basically our response was mainly that using different modalities um, to increase the, to increase access to services, which um, I think it was um, quite successful. The but we had to react very quickly and um, the our, our our staff had to adapt and it obviously it, it caused a lot of stress and stuff as well so we had to support the staff um as well so basically this is what i wanted to say the importance of um not only the treatment and the prevention but one has to increase access to services and how we had developed it um with the new pandemic challenge Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Anton. Um, moving on now to Professor Anil Taplial. Uh, Anil is well known for pioneering the design, development, and most importantly, the implementation of e-mental health frameworks and various e-mental health initiatives in primary care, uh, secondary care, and public health in many countries around the globe. 
After having co-designed several digital mental health initiatives with mental health service users, he is guided by his firm conviction that we must focus on the service user, their families and carers. And if it does not work for them, it doesn't work. He's also the executive director of eMental Health, international collaborative supported by Sweden, Canada, the USA, Australia and New Zealand. Anil, you're very welcome. Um, can we have your three-minute introductory remarks? Thank you, Frederick. Um, and so one thing that we have learned, and the previous speakers have uh, touched on it, is that COVID and and the, um, the impact of it on the around the globe, but it has also taught us uh, much about the communication, regardless of our age, ethnicity, how we are connecting and communicating with our loved ones across the geographical boundaries. Uh, a very interesting survey in the UK about how we are using the phones these days gave some useful insights in the following order. Number one is text. Number two is email. Number three is Facebook. Number four is camera. Number uh, five is news. Number six is shopping. Number seven is weather. Number eight is WhatsApp. Number nine is banking. Number 10 is YouTube. And making the phone call from a phone is number 11 activity. So that says a lot about how we are communicating and what we use the phone for. Um, and uh, making a phone call did not make it to the top 10 activity on a phone. So uh, then when we look at uh, proliferation of digital technologies, at the moment, right at this point of time, there are more than 400,000 health apps out there. Unfortunately, 65% of those apps have never, ever been updated for the last 18 months. That means the content is dated and they're not safe and effective. So at the moment, uh, of the 400,000 apps that are out there, only 15% of those are what we would classify as safe and effective to be used because there is a, some methodology that is sitting behind them and they are, uh, and some reputable institutions are behind them to ensure that they are safe and effective. And so the challenge is how do we ensure uh, that as nation, nations we are procuring the right um, uh, tools and services for our citizens? And also looking at um, how do we understand the domain that is spanning across not just apps. It's not just about apps and the website. It's about information provision is one big domain with an e-mental health. Then engagement, whether it be PROM and PREM tools, looking at the self of self-management tools, looking at the social support uh, post-discharge from services. But also, how do we contextualize all of that within the context of e-mental health frameworks for the country? What do the standards look like and the policy and strategy? So with that, I'll conclude here at this point of time. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Anil. Um, now let's turn to Liz Brand. Uh, Liz is the co-founder and chief executive officer of Control Shift, a data innovation consultancy that has been at the forefront of citizen data empowerment and how individuals can use their personal data to make better decisions and better manage their lives. A key area of focus is the societal benefits of personal data, especially around our health and well-being and how we decarbonize our lives and how we manage it, our finances. Liz, can we have your opening three re minutes remarks? Yeah, thanks very much for the introduction, Vega, and thanks for having me here today. It's great. Um, as you mentioned, I have that confession to make, which is I am, in fact, a personal data specialist, which has been um, very unpopular as a party guest in the past. But um, I have been working on it for the last 15 years uh, alongside a, a lot of absolutely brilliant people around the world on how personal data can help individuals make those better decisions that you introduced, uh, Gregor and manage their lives more effectively. And of course, as we've all become increasingly aware of how our data is being used or abused, I've become quite a popular party guest. Well, I would be if it wasn't for, for COVID, that is. Um, so 
What I'd like to introduce today is how our personal data can be used to help each of us stay mentally well, maintaining our privacy, control, and importantly, our agency. Almost two years ago, we at Control Shift started looking into how personal data can help with mental health care. My knowledge of mental health has increased hugely since then, and I've become completely convinced that one of the most valuable uses of our mental data is not for mental health care, but for population-wide mental well-being, helping each and every one of us proactively manage our mental well-being. The pandemic has brought home to all of us, individuals, employers, how and governments, how fragile our mental well-being can be, with many of us, me included, having felt those edges at least once in the last six months and previous years of, of much of that. The pandemic has brought home to all of us how important that mental well-being is to fu a functioning society and economy, families and friendships. And uh, it's, it's really amazing, isn't it, that we actually need a pandemic to tell us that. Because when we started to look at mental health two years ago, it was really apparent that there's a chronic undersupply in the mental health, health, in mental health services. And that was even before COVID. Um, let's face it, it, it is quite easy to ignore in some ways because there's no blood test for mental health. It's harder to prove and it's harder to prove clinical outcomes without a way of testing. And it's hard to fund without that evidence. But I see that our personal data is that evidence, it is that proof. And earlier this year, we started a programme of work with HMPC, Facebook, Public Health England, with Gregor, and together all to develop a, a mental wellbeing service, which enables individuals to use their life data, from their bank, their activity trackers, phones, internet browsing, to use their data as a tool in their hands to spot trends in their mental wellbeing and nudge their own behaviours to stay mentally well. A developing uh, to develop population health services that prevent rather than treat and offers individuals access to relevant and tailored support and treatment. Personal data has long been vaunted as the new oil, and many people have experienced it with little regard for the sustainability of the market and the trust of the individuals. I'd hope that mental well-being, for mental well-being, personal data is not the new oil, but the blood that we can take to understand our mental well-being and help us all stay mentally well. The foundations for a strong economy, foundations for a strong society, and the foundations for a life well lived. Thank you. Great, thanks, Liz. And finally, our last introductory speaker is Martega Swabi, uh, who has over 15 years' experience in improving emotional well-being. Marteka is the founder of Benevolent Health and Mind Hub Emotional Technology, passionate about sharing diverse narratives. Marteka is a psychotherapist with 10 years clinical expertise alongside delivering a, a range of online summits, workshops and training programs to increase resilience, well-being and belonging. Welcome, Marteka. Thanks, Gregor, and thank you for listening, whether you're watching live or um, on the replay. I think we're in such interesting times, and sometimes it feels like I'm a kid in a sweet shop, you know, excited by all the jars of sweets and all the new um, in innovative and creative things that we can do in these times, but also the level of, of uncertainty that I have within myself and I see in other people around COVID um, is also uh, sometimes a little bit depressing. And I think that, you know, mental health is on the spectrum, isn't it, of kind of being being manic um, at one end and being depressed at the other end. And I think it's a really challenging time for organisations, for leaders um, to be really a helping um, and understanding uh, this issue and how um, we can impact this into um, the workplace. I think it's really important to kind of flip the script on this a little bit in terms of um, the illness model um, and treating people. And even though that's really important, um, I think that particularly in the workplace, there's a real opportunity as we create these hybrid workplaces and as we create um, 
these new models and new ways of working to really think about this from a preventative perspective. So actually looking at mental health, that we all have mental health um, and, you know, we all feel stressed and anxious and a little bit depressed. Um, at times, because I think that changes the narrative slightly. Um, so some of the things that I've been thinking about is um, just around personalization for employees and employee well-being and what that looks like, because one size doesn't fit all um, in this narrative. Um, the next thing that I've been thinking about a lot is with leaders is just around how we realign and learn um, to manage um, well-being and, and build emotional resilience um, amongst leaders, but also in the work context and how we fit that into the infrastructures of our, our workplaces, that it's not um, something that's on the sideline, but actually integrated as part of our day to day. And then the final thing um, that I've been thinking about is just the intersectionality. And as you can see from kind of what's been happening globally with Black Lives Matter and the narrative around diversity and inclusion in organisations, particularly organisations that are set to thrive, is really that intersectionality between well-being and, and diversity and inclusion and including those narratives for people to feel valued, for belonging, for meaningful um, workplace activity because I really think this impacts our productivity and our happiness um, in, in, in the workplace. Great, thank you very much Martika. I'm going to um, just pick up on a couple of points from each of the panellists. Lena, can I come to you first? We had some discussions before the uh, the event and one of the things that struck me was from your clinical experience and also the work you do uh, with organisations and businesses can you give us some of the coping strategies that you think uh, are most effective at this time? Yeah, so I've, I've seen uh, like many different kinds of coping strategies. Uh, among the more proactive ones, you can split them into outward, uh, outward expressions and inward uh, expressions. Examples of the outward uh, expressions is that uh, kind of uh, spending more time in nature, people have more time to to be reaching out to others in creative ways, uh, to engage in arts, for example, and creative work uh, is the way that I really see help people. Uh, so it's a lot of creativity, I guess, uh, and also being creative in the way they engage with other people, kind of uh, try to provide support for others and feel like that gives a kind of meaning and structure in their life um, to feel of use for others and so on. So that is examples of the more outward expression and then you have the inward expression uh, where you might have more time for inner reflection, uh, contemplation, people have more time for meditation, uh, so they reflect on their lives um, and get some kind of new light. May, I've, I've seen people change career paths for example, uh, so, so it gives a kind of window to step back a little and reflect upon uh, how you've been living your life and uh, what you might want to change. Uh, so see, uh, this is really helping people. It, it becomes a kind of self-care. Uh, and I, I really think that both therapists and business leaders should support this kind of uh, proactive uh, strategies that is possible for people while working, taking frequent uh, breaks, uh, being able to practice uh, regular routines. It's also really important to have some structure uh, around the day. Uh, so I think it helps both the individual in reducing symptoms and it really boosts um, or facilitates both individual resilience and societal resilience. So I really think it also helps them uh, fostering empathy and collaboration. So we really need to continue to promote such uh, proactive uh, coping strategies in the times to come. 
Also, Great, thank you. also yeah. among uh, healthcare pro uh, professionals, of course. Thank you. I really like the way that you talk about the inward and the outward, and that's very um, sympathetic with the integrative approach of uh, internal and external. That's great. Marteka, can I come to you? Because um, a lot of the focus of coping strategies can be put on individuals, which is absolutely fine. But in the workplaces, what can workplaces do to help create the conditions, both the environmental and the ethos conditions where uh, it's a lot easier and a lot more natural uh, for people and teams and organizations to be um, developing coping strategies and looking after their mental health and well-being. What, what would you advise workplaces and businesses to do to help create those conditions? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a really good question. And just building on to kind of what Lena was talking about in terms of self-care. And one of the things that I often talk to organizations about, particularly in COVID, is, you know, we've got these amazing, um, you know, health and safety kind of risk management plans, business continuity plans that are very focused on the physical safety of COVID. And that's absolutely key. It's important. But also, I think there is something about how we build into our day to day in, in the workplace, whether that's working from home um, or, or returning to the office, how we build into that these kind of self-care um, processes and, and taking care of our well-being. And I think from a mental fitness perspective, if we're looking, you know, at, you know, what we eat, um, do we exercise enough? Are we having enough movement? Are we getting enough sleep? You know, what's our connection and relationships like? And, you know, why is this a business problem? Well, actually, if we come to work, you know, feeling happy and, and, and we're going to be much more productive. So how how do we build that into our business continuity plans? How do we make this part of our team meeting processes? And actually, how do we build it into the culture and the foundations of the organization? Because I think there's a real um, opportunities for leaders to lead by example. And, you know, we're in this time where actually organizations are having to do rapid digital transformation, um, you know, and, and how we, we build that into these day-to-day -day processes that, that businesses are um, having to grapple with at the moment. And I really feel, you know, if we want to thrive, if, if businesses want to thrive, then this is going to be like kind of IT skills that we're all going to have to know how to build resilience, how to improve mental health. Great, great. And, and I think one of the things that people have been observing is that as offices begin to return or are planning returns, they make a lot of emphasis during uh, COVID on the physical structures and the physical spacing of the workplace and not enough time and attention to the emotional, mental health and social aspects of the workplace and also supporting people with emotional and psychological safety and well-being uh, whilst working at home. So your remarks are absolutely key that it's built into the business ethos and the web and the weave of how an organization works and operates. Um, Anton, can I come to you next? Because when we had our um, pre-event conversations, you were very uh, enthusiastic about the role and, and contribution of the voluntary and community sector in Malta uh, to pivoting and really providing a good outreach service response. Can you share a little bit more about what civil and civic society organizations have done in Malta and how important they are to the response to the pandemic and the ongoing reaching out to people in the community? Um, thank you. Um, I think it's very crucial that it's not only the structured official services um, reach out to people in need, but it's also very important the voluntary sector. In Malta, um, culturally, the family is still quite strong. Luckily. So um, we have an organization, which is the Organization for the, Rel for the Relatives of Service Users. And during the pandemic, it, was, uh, it, it did a lot of sterling work in, in, supporting, um, in supporting individuals. But also we have NGOs like, for example, the Richmond Foundation, which also did um, a lot of work. But what it's also very important is that not only these 
organizations that had already existed. But we worked very hard to create in the community a sense of supporting each other and helping each other. And we did that by using the media as much as possible. Um, we had um, adverts in, in, the, in the television and the social media. And uh, we, we used the hashtag, we, we are in this together. And we, we tried um, to create the spirit in this community that this is not something which is affecting individuals, but affecting all, all the community. As I said in the introduction, I think one of the main reasons why there was so many relapses of mental illness is because of the loss of the social network. Mm. So we tried to react to that as much as possible um, to create this community um, community spirit. Great, thank you. And, and it's such a true um, phrase that no one recovers alone and, and, and that whole sense of mutual aid is absolutely uh, vital at this time. And I think your examples of the use of media and communications to get that message out is absolutely key. Anil, can I come to you now? Because we had discussions about some of the international strategies that you've seen being put in place for e-mental health. And you're giving me some really good examples. Can you just talk through some of the best practice examples of countries or jurisdictions or local areas that have begin, begun to implement a proper and true digital mental health strategy? Uh, and I know that some of them have been doing this at the time of COVID. So if you can give us some examples, that would be great. That's great. So, so look, um, if I, because uh, the moment you utter the word called digital mental health or e-mental health, you think about the programmers and coders uh, weaving away and coding some solutions. The reality is I'm talking about the communication and I've heard um, a great deal today in an eloquent way about power of personalization. So, um, so some of the work which is happening, uh, the cutting edge work which is happening around the world, it's nothing to do with the money. It's nothing to do with the technology. It's all to do with the leadership. And if you've got the right leadership, somehow the money arrives and the right things get done. And uh, it's, uh, so I'm a big fan of uh, getting the right leadership. And I'm a big fan of what's happening in Canada. Uh, we are talking about the Mental Health Commission of Canada has taken an amazing leadership. They had that vision 10 years ago, not during the COVID times. They had the vision 10 years ago. They did something about it then. Then there's a province of Canada called Newfoundland and Labrador, the director for mental health. She has been one of the... Um, they had such a large uh, province, which is twice the size of New Zealand, with half a million population. They do not want to open a, a clinic for every community of 200 people. There is, it doesn't matter how much fiscal resources you have, it's not plausible to have that many hospitals. So same uh, uh, challenges lie for Australia, and Australia has shown at both at the federal level and some state levels, amazing examples of, so, but, if what it boils down to is good leadership, but also these are not digital solutions where we are simply receiving a text message or some sort of a web interface. The power of personalization is the key again. And so one of the good examples I'll give you is where a, one of the services in New Zealand where uh, we are talking about anything up to 19,000 contacts per month with young people. But one of the key uh, drivers in that service is Every time somebody responds to you, say, Gregor, you are a 14-year-old young person, and somebody asks you, dear Gregor, uh, uh, you know, we know you're going through some challenging time. Uh, would you like to talk to somebody? And Gregor writes back because he's never heard somebody, rather than say, hey, we get urgent message saying ring police or ambulance or whatever. So somebody they, uh, cared uh, enough to write to you personally. So one in three users of that service write back, are you a real person? And that's where the magic is, when people know that somebody cares and is there for them. So I call it a virtual friendship bench, which is, it came out of Zimbabwe. Wow. That's great. And, and uh, thank you for taking me back to my 14-year-old self. Uh, oh, to go back in a time machine and have all that time over again. Um, Liz, can I come to you? Because um, your expertise is very much around ensuring that the data is used for individuals. And some people might have concerns that the data from the mental well-being service doesn't offer access to real-life world data, 
um, for research and practices. Can you just give us some of the assurances from the work you're doing around the use of personal data and how that is actually used to benefit the individual? So can you talk us through some specifics? Yes, thanks, Gregor. It's, it's been very interesting while we've been working with individuals to look at how that personal data can be used to help them. Um, there's uh, initially quite a, a sense of nervousness about a huge amount of their personal data being used. Um, and when they realise that actually it's used in a way that is totally under their control, using a, a, an ar a data architecture that's called personal data mobility, only they can see the data. Only they can actually use the data. The tools are in their hands. They, they're, they're the people in control. So for them, suddenly there's a release. There's an ability to actually see and use the technology themselves in their lives. And that, that was really amazing when we actually worked with people and you could see how they would respond to it. And, and people saying, you know, it stops me falling to the absolute lowest before I, before I can't do anything about it. I can actually see it coming whereas before i couldn't see it coming i wasn't in a in a in a mental state to actually see it coming so it's it was it's been really extraordinary to do that and i and i think the other thing as you touched on gregor that's that's really important is those people are absolutely willing to to share that data consented yeah. consented and permissioned yeah. with people who can help them either in provision of uh, help um uh, in the community, as Anil was talking about, or in the workplace, as Marketa was talking about, or, or in the community, as Anton was talking about, you know, they're willing to share that with people and, and it pulls those people together. But also, and I think really importantly, willing to share that data with people who are who want to um, research what's going on. So real world data, permissioned and consented from people who are happy to have, have that data used. And, and it's done in a way which really gives those people agency and, and helps them help everybody else. And, and so, you know, I, I see a really exciting future for uh, reducing timescales for research, making it more evidence-based, mm -hmm. making more connected to the individual and making us all more connected uh, um, through that data into the community, friendships um, and family. It sounds crucial, and I think uh, Anil also the way that the, those kind of data use reassurances must form a, a key part of any overall digital uh, mental health strategy. Let's um, now come to some closing remarks. I've asked each of the panelists to prepare three take-home messages that they'd like to leave uh, the audience with, that are the live audience and also the recorded audience. So let's see if we can um, pull out some of the main messages you would like to give. And it doesn't really matter who you want to give them to, but I'm, I'm hoping some of the, the target audience that you have in mind are those who are in governments and policy making uh, decision roles and those who are leaders in business who are really trying to grapple and get their heads around how they can best respond to mental health uh, for their employees, their workplace, but also uh, end users. So, Lena, can you give us some of your uh, take-home messages, please? Yeah, like I already mentioned, uh, it has really highlighted the value of mental health and really integrating it into all of healthcare, but also across societal contact uh, within the communities, within businesses and do it in a really holistic and person-centered way. So it has really shot the spotlight on the need for this, and I think it's no doubt about this. And I see also business leaders are more open and have understand uh, the importance of really prioritizing this. So I'm very hopeful about uh, this being more on the agenda. And then we have also seen what kind of skills might be needed in the future. We have seen uh, the value of interpersonal skills like empathy, compassion, uh, collaboration, and so on. And we are also seeing the need for digital skills, uh, given the rapid digitalization, and especially investing in, in um, teaching these skills to healthcare providers. Uh, we need to do that more. 
Um, and we have also seen really the, the need for more flexible skills and being able to adapt to different uh, environments, to uncertainty and so on. So I think uh, the decade of um, more specialized uh, skills are maybe over. We need to be flexible and have an open-minded and really innovative mindset. Uh, and then, then I see that, um, of course, uh, it has also demonstrated the value of just taking a break and uh, step back and reflect on what is not working too well in our society and, and uh, really see how that can help both uh, facilitate uh, the needed solutions, uh, but giving clues to, to how each of one can, each of us can take responsibility and it starts with each individual to really walk or talk and it's time also to take action and not only use words. So that is my takeaway from. Great, thanks. And, and just to, um, share with panel members, we've got three minutes 30 left. So can I now come to you, Anton, for your three closing remarks? I'll try to be short. Um, mainly, the pandemic has shown how important is the social network. The breakup has left grave consequences. So my take-home message is that we need to strengthen it, both in terms of society as large, society needs to be more cohesive, and in terms of services, we need to be more present in community, and there needs to be collaboration between what are official services and voluntary services. Great, thank you. Um, Anil? Well, my three uh, take-home messages are, one is because we're talking about the larger sort of government uh, country level context, so we must have a collaboration across uh, the domains, such as people with the lived experience need to be part of development of the solutions which they're going to use. Uh, who says it works? So we must um, involve academia. There needs to be a collaboration with the frontline workforce. So it doesn't matter whether they're psychiatrists, GPs, social workers, because they, they don't know these solutions exist and nobody's going to be using them. And uh, the fourth one is um, uh, the policy, the funders and planners need to be involved because if you're not solving a pain point for the various countries, um, then um, nobody's going to be procuring those solutions. And the fifth and not the last one, but is um, health IT industry uh, should also be part of the collaborative frameworks. But also looking at, uh, I talked about the range of solutions, uh, uh, the range of ways in which people are communicating these days. So we have to speak the consumer's language. If we are not in that environment, we will not be speaking to the consumers of today. And let's get it right by design, not by default, and let's keep it simple. And I'll, I always quote, one plus one equals 11. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Liz? Yeah, so, um, I mean, it's, it's really obviously about personal data for me. And personal data, I think we... Thinking about it, it's so easy to fear it because we can see the harm that is, that's being uh, created with personal data around the world. But it's actually a tool for people uh, and it can be a force for amazing good. So let's let's not run away from it. it it's the technical ability to do what I've been talking about is possible today. And, and we can build the services and design the services. What's really critical is that governments and regulators design their digital economies to enable that personal data to be available in a safe, privacy-enhancing way. And that is absolutely critical if we're going to create mental well-being services at scale. Great. Great. Um, Marteka, we've got 30 seconds, so off we go. So here we go. I, I just think that we need more love in workplaces. We need more love in communities. And we just need more kindness, right? So my all-round tip would be just be kind. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, we've got 12 seconds left. Thank you very much, panel. And w wherever you're watching, uh, either now or on the rerun, uh, we do hope that this has given you some great food for thought. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Gregor. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Gregor.
That's it done. Great, guys. Well, have enjoy the rest of your day. And uh, been great working with you. And I will be working with all of you again. I know that. I feel it in my bones. <laughs> Take care. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.